Good morning. This is Ariana Longley from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. It is 9 o'clock uh, Pacific time on the dot, so we're going to get started with our quarterly Patient Safety Movement Foundation webinar. Um, so again, thank you all for joining. Um, just as a tiny bit of housekeeping, we have muted everyone upon entry, um, so please keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. We will have time for questions at the end. So today we present to you our Patient Safety Curriculum for All Health Professionals webinar. Um, again, I'm Ariana Longley, the Chief Operating Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and we are very excited to have two expert presenters with us this morning, Dr. Stephen Scheinman and Dr. Margaret or Peggy Shoemaker. Um, so I'm going to go through our agenda real briefly, just so you have an idea of what our goals are for today. The first 10 minutes I'll spend introducing you to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and our actionable patient safety solutions. We call those apps. We'll then have the majority of the time, 40 minutes, to um, hear from Dr. Scheinman and Dr. Shoemaker, and then we'll have 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, please utilize the chat feature that you'll see on WebEx. You can post your questions as they come throughout the presentation. Um, we're happy to, uh, we'll be kind of scrubbing those at the end, and we'll have, again, 10 minutes to answer those questions via chat. We haven't been successful unseeing the line just because there's feedback, so again, please note that you should be using the chat feature um, so we can answer your questions at the end. So the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, we have this bold and audacious goal of zero preventable deaths by 2020. And how we do that is we're fostering new efforts and building on to existing patient safety programs through commitments to zero. I just wanted to briefly, uh, for those of you who are new to our network, um, give you an example of who all can take action within our network. So the first group that we work with are hospitals and healthcare organizations, and we encourage them to make commitments, which are free uh, online uh, uh, commitments that we encourage through our website that encourage shared learning through our platform. The second group that we work with are committed partners, and these are organizations that, you know, nonprofits, professional societies, associations, advocacy groups, anyone else, the way I explain it is anyone who would want to wave a patient safety flag if it existed, we work with those partners, and they sign individualized commitment to action letters. And all of those are transparently shared through our website so you can see what organizations are doing what. The third group that we work with are healthcare technology companies. So all of those technology companies that sit at the bedside that help connect data and information, we encourage them to sign the Open Data Pledge, which is a pledge that we designed in 2013 to freely share information without only blocking or charging for that data connection. The fourth group that we work with are patients and family advocates. We encourage them to share their story or their family member's story so to inspire change. And we also um, encourage them to utilize resources and also share resources that they've found that have been helpful so that we can share that through our network. So our actionable patient safety solutions. These are essentially our product. They're freely available online. We currently focus on 18 overarching challenges that we feel are challenging hospitals today. And if they implemented processes around these issues, they could get close to and hover around zero preventable deaths. So you'll see on this slide the list of 18. Some of these topics also have, we call them sub-apps or some sub-topics. Um, and those would include, for instance, healthcare-associated infections or medication safety or even embolic events where we focus in on and hone in on specific uh, solutions to these challenges. In total, there are 34 total solutions that we recommend that hospitals review um, and essentially take a self-assessment to ensure that their hospital is truly doing everything available to get to zero. So today, we're going to be focusing on the bottom left corner, patient safety curriculum, it's our newest actionable patient safety solution published in uh, January of this year that uh, Dr. Scheinman and Dr. Shoemaker were instrumental in, um, in helping to develop. I also just 
just wanted to share briefly some of the impact that we've had to date by in, in engaging um, these partners in our work. So we started again in 2012, our first data point in 2013, we had 63 hospitals in our network. And in 2019, earlier this year in January, we announced that 4,710 hospitals are working with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And that's spread across 43 countries. Those hospitals, um, by making commitments around those topics that I showed you on the, the previous slide, um, have shared with us that they've saved 90,146 lives in 2018 alone by implementing those processes or other known processes. So that's, that's why we're here, is to save lives, to encourage implementation of processes and to share those successes with the larger network. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our two esteemed speakers for the day. I'll first start with Dr. Stephen Scheinman. He's President and Dean of Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. He's also the EVP and Chief Academic Officer at the Geisinger Health System. And Dr. Scheinman is an internist and nephrologist who has earned international prominence for his research into the genetics of inherited kid kidney diseases and kidney stones. He's published more than 90 peer-reviewed articles, reviews, and book chapters on topics related to kidney disease and genetics. He's also served on review boards for the NIH, American Heart Association, American Society of Nephrology, American Federation for Clinical and Medical Research, and National Kidney Foundation, amongst others. He's a fellow of the American College of Physicians and of the American Society of Nephrology, and is an elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Dr. Scheinman is an advocate on uh, healthcare workforce issues and matters affecting medical schools. Our next speaker is Margaret Shoemaker. She is Assistant Chair of Internal Medicine at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine and Chair of the Geisinger Patient Safety Work Group. Uh, Dr. Scheinman is a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and completed her residency in internal medicine and fellowship in endocrinology and metabolism there. She's board certified in both, and in addition to maintaining a clinical endocrinology practice in Williamsport, she's been instrumental in the clinical education of physician assistant students, medical students, and family medicine residents. Dr. Shoemaker joined clinical faculty at the Commonwealth Medical College, which is Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, and um, as a regional assistant dean in 2010, and has served as assistant chair for internal medicine since 2012. She has special interest in quality and safety, and that led her to oversee development and implementation of a quality and safety curriculum for medical students at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine since 2016. She joined the Patient Safety Movement Foundation Curriculum Group in 2017 and helps head the Patient Safety Curriculum Development Project with Dr. Scheinman. So with that, I'm going to pass it first off to Dr. Scheinman to, um, to continue the webinar. Thank you very much, Ariana, and good morning or good afternoon to uh, everyone on this webinar. Uh, what, it, it's a great pleasure to describe uh, this curriculum, which represents the work of a uh, group, a core group that was over a dozen people, but um, had significant uh, contributions from uh, a larger number, um, including, I imagine, some people on this call, uh, working uh, over the past year and a half. Uh, and although we announced this curriculum at the summit in January, uh, the curriculum remains a living document. Uh, the group continues uh, to meet uh, regularly, um, and uh, we plan to uh, uh, keep this curriculum updated and to build onto the website the ability for users of the curriculum uh, to suggest updates or improvements. Uh, so uh, we welcome those. Uh, the charge that uh, Joe Chiani uh, gave us was not to reproduce the excellent curricular content that's already out there from the World Health Organization, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, uh, and the number of uh, specialties, uh, but rather to create a curriculum that would be um, uh, implemented and used more widely than those have been adopted uh, because uh, it's user-friendly. And so the goal is to create a curriculum that is adaptable to clinical learners across the spectrum of professional development, from novice uh, introductory uh, learners to, uh, to advanced experts, practitioners. Uh, 
um, grade curriculum that's applicable across all healthcare professions and not specific to any individual profession. That emphasizes the benefits of team-based care and very importantly and consistent with the values and culture of the, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation itself, highlights the patient's voice and the family's voice in the healthcare experience. Uh, these, are, these all represent uh, the significant foundation of the curriculum I'll be describing. Uh, so on the next slide, um, the, uh, what we've, we've called these the virtues that we believe will uh, make this curriculum um, adaptable and usable across a wide range of settings. Uh, so once again, it's, mo it's modular. And the, because, it's, because it's modular, we believe it will be um, uh, quite yes. adaptable to a range of, um, uh, of learners, uh, novice to expert, across the professions, uh, and effective for use in part or in its entirety. So people can uh, choose to emphasize, for example, communication, which is uh, critically important in patient safety, uh, and focus on that more than on other areas. Um, uh, if that's uh, felt to be the need in that particular clinical setting. Suitable for a variety of teaching strategies, whether they are classroom or a range of other settings. Uh, conducive to delivery by non-expert facilitators, which is important since not everybody has got a faculty of patient safety educators uh, on, uh, on site, uh, so that um, uh, a range of facilitators can, will find this curriculum easy to use and to adapt to various settings. The time requirements are practical and, again, modular so that uh, these can be, um, uh, uh, can be expanded uh, to, be, to, to fit multiple sessions, for example, or it can be abbreviated to fit brief sessions over multiple, uh, on multiple occasions. Um, uh, there are uh, multiple opportunities to make the uh, examples experiential and to link the curriculum to specific experiential settings in the clinical environment. And we offer within the curriculum a wide range of uh, resource support, uh, which I'll describe uh, in a few slides. So moving on, we began by defining eight fundamental domains, and these are, this is the organizing structure for the curriculum. And uh, I think everyone, as you see these domains, will agree that they are fundamental to patient safety. So error science and system science, uh, the human factors that, are, uh, that contribute, unfortunately, so significantly uh, to um, errors, technology, which is clearly very important, teamwork and communication, which uh, the, uh, the team writing this curriculum spent a lot of time thinking about and which the uh, evidence clearly indicates uh, is a significant contributor to patient error. Uh, leadership training and leading change as we will all need to promote organizational change wherever we are uh, to bring us to the next level of patient safety, to create a culture of safety, um, and ultimately achieve patient-oriented safe care. So in each of these domains, we've identified specific areas within those domains, subdomains, uh, to focus on. And uh, I will uh, illustrate the structure of how we've taken this approach around these eight domains uh, on the next slide. So for each domain, uh, what we have within the curriculum is a definition of the domain and a, uh, what we illustrate using a sticky note, and I'll show you what that looks like. It looks like a sticky note, which has on it um, a reference to a, a national initiative on patient safety that is relevant to that domain. Um, and within each domain, we have identified a, a two or more subdomains. Uh, and within each subdomain, there are specific learning objectives. And for each learning objective, there are examples of competencies that should be demonstrated for uh, us to be able to, or for you to be able 
to determine that somebody has uh, achieved the goal for that learning objective. And I'll be more specific and give examples uh, 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 in, uh, as we go forward. The, uh, and for each domain, we have a specific set of resources. And some of the resources, for example, case examples, illustrate principles for more than one domain. But we'll get into that in a minute. So on the next slide, we have an example of um, how this modular design works for one of the domains, uh, one that we think is particularly important, teamwork and communication. So our definition of this domain is that it addresses the concept of teams in healthcare delivery and emphasizes the knowledge, attitudes, skills, and behaviors required of effective teams to deliver safe care. Um, Error-prone gaps in care are highlighted with content offering, offering validated communication framework to ensure patients' safe transitions across the healthcare experience. And the sticky note illustrates uh, that the Joint Commission, um, uh, and some of you may need to move uh, your chat window uh, away. You have the ability to do that uh, or close it. Um, to see the sticky note. Uh, the joint, this sticky note illustrates the Joint Commission's national patient safety goals, including communicating medication information, teamwork training, order readback, standardized abbreviations, um, and the National Equality Forum's uh, safe practice. So, um, uh, so the sticky notes simply illustrate uh, and emphasize elements of this. And then if we look at the subdomains within teamwork and communication, there are three. Teams in healthcare, handoffs and gaps, and team steps. And if we look at, the, at a learning objective under the first subdomain, teams, that learning objective would have a developmental verb, which, is, which changes, uh, which is different for each of the five developmental stages that we've defined. So, uh, and I'll give an example, I'll, I'll show that. On, uh, a subsequent slide that we're not ready to advance to yet. Um, so either to understand or to a model uh, or um, uh, to master the benefits of effective interprofessional teams and their role in patient safety. I'll go more into that in a minute. And the resources supporting uh, these learning objectives um, are resource, uh, are, include role play materials, which we think is a really valuable technique for illustrating um, these, exam these uh, principles. Um, so they are role-playing, not literal scripts, uh, but they are uh, role-playing role uh, cues uh, that assign roles to people who can, um, uh, in your uh, team exercise, um, uh, each uh, play out various scenarios. Uh, we have videos, links to videos, uh, specific uh, case examples. Um, people are free to use local experiences uh, for group discussion, and we offer uh, some uh, experiences. Online re links to online resources, materials for didactics, uh, and supplemental readings. And for each of the learning objectives, we give examples of, competent, of, of how you can show the competency is achieved. So if we move on to the next slide, I'll be more specific about this. So if we look at that subdomain, first subdomain under the domain of teams, the learning objectives, the, the developmental verb varies depending on whether you're a novice, an advanced beginner, competent uh, practitioner, proficient practitioner, or an expert. So a novice just beginning their education uh, in that profession would be expected to demonstrate competency would need to show that they can recognize the benefits of effective interprofessional teams. An advanced beginner would be expected to be able to articulate those benefits. Um, and uh, moving along, somebody who's an expert would be expected not just to model it, but to actually teach the role of effective interprofessional teams and their role in patient safety. And uh, we, can sh we show on the next slide how each of these learners might um, yeah, it, it demonstrate their competency through these examples. And uh, so there are several, and I won't go through all of them, but the first one shows that after discussion of case studies, the student 
if this is a novice, these are all these bullets are for the novice learner who needs to demonstrate that they can recognize the benefits of effective interprofessional teams. So one would be that they can uh, demonstrate that they can identify the benefits of professional teams or can list the essential characteristics of highly, highly functioning interprofessional teams showing mutual respect and shared values and psychological safety, uh, et cetera. And I won't go through the other bullets, but uh, you'll have the slides and you can read them. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, the resources, as I've said, include links to videos and patient stories, and as is uh, the, the uh, foundation illustrates so well, uh, there's nothing more powerful in educating people and motivating them to master a competency or uh, to solve a problem than to appreciate the specific patient stories in which, in which uh, patients can teach us uh, about the importance of that particular uh, competency. Real life experiences, uh, and if we keep moving along, uh, online, links to online resources, materials for didactics, uh, materials for role play, which we think, as I said, is very important, and supplemental readings. So these vary by a domain, um, but, uh, and some of them, as I've said, overlap, uh, and facilitators can choose which one is a, uh, most um, valuable for the setting and for the goal for that particular session. So I think with this slide, I'm now about to hand the uh, uh, the presentation uh, over to uh, Peggy Shoemaker. Yes, and, and I'm here. Good to go. Thank you, Ariana, and uh, thank you, Steve. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. So now that you've had an overview of the content and the design of our curriculum, what I'd like to talk about is implementation. So one approach might be programmatic implementation, which would involve a crosswalk of your curriculum from the entry level through the gradu graduating level, the identification of gaps uh, that are not currently being delivered uh, across the, uh, again, first through the final years, and then decisions on where and when uh, to, um, to implement them and also a lot of commitment from leadership, not only a variety of course directors, but curriculum committees and so on. Then beyond that, all the faculty have to uh, undergo faculty development, so everybody's on board, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I would say that even for the most ardent supporters of patient safety, that may be a bit daunting. So alternatively, I'd like us to think about small steps that can still lead to significant change. Because frankly, we don't have the luxury of sitting back and uh, taking time um, when patients are dying or suffering from medical error otherwise unnecessarily. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about what we can do. Let's talk about achievable implementation. So what I'd like us to do is to consider a four-step process. And this process, facilitator pre-work, curriculum preparation, engagement of learners, and outcomes assessment is also included step-by-step uh, -step in your introduction that is getting started, the getting started section of our curriculum. Next slide. Step one, the facilitator. So you, as an educator, have authority over a specific area of content on which you interact with your learners. So I would suggest that you look at our executive summary. It's all of three pages. It includes the eight domains, their definitions, and their subdomains only. And after that review of the executive summary, identify the area of content of our curriculum that best overlaps with the area of content that you cover with your learners. Once you've identified that, then you can look at areas of gaps that you might be able to practically 
integrate into what you're already doing to do more to train your learners in patient safety principles. Next slide. So, for example, if you are a facilitator who works with preclinical students in any healthcare uh, discipline, it's very likely that you're training them on some sort of patient-centered communication. But in doing that, are you also emphasizing to the students that this is, um, it, it is foundational to patient safety, that we include the patient and family and their voice as part of the healthcare team. You may be offering team building skills for your students and some interprofessional education experiences. But are you emphasizing that this too is foundational to patient safety and that part of why we do this is to develop respect, shared values, and psychological safety among team members as they provide uh, care in the clinical setting. Your coursework may include case-based learning. It would be very simple, I suggest, that you might compare and contrast in a given case what the difference between a younger individual who presents with that problem, let's say nephrolithiasis, for example, a 40-year-old otherwise healthy presenting with nephrolithiasis versus an, el versus an elderly patient with multiple comorbidities and how those patient characteristics increase the risk for medical error in a variety of ways. So these are opportunities to emphasize patient safety and what you're already doing. Now, if you are a facilitator who, oh, thank you. If you're a facilitator who works with students in the clinical setting, opportunities to increase patient safety teaching abound. For example, students in the clinical setting might simply reflect on the benefits of including the patient and family as team members in the decision to choose what medication they're going to um, select for treatment of new onset hypertension. Or if you're in part of running uh, simulation-based uh, clinical skills training for your students, it would be very simple, for example, to require that the student opens the encounter by verifying the full name and date of birth of the patient and develop that so that they develop that habit for the future. And that would also be beneficial to reducing medical error. And then there's the just-in-time teaching that can happen throughout the day in the clinical setting where facilitators like yourselves who are advocates of patient safety are modeling behaviors that will reduce medical error in a variety of ways by communicating with patients, communicating with peers, modeling just culture in team settings, perhaps reporting a near miss in your medical error system, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. Let's go on to step two then. And remember, you as the facilitator are now gonna be doing this curricular preparation for your own specific area of content within our curriculum that is most relevant to what you teach. You would at that point identify the domain or domains of interest and take a deeper dive into the module that Steve described. The module that includes its definition, its a subdomain, its learning objectives, and all its resources. Having an understanding of that module, you can then identify the area that will best fill the gap that you've noted in what you're currently delivering. And the other thing you need to do is to identify what target level of competency you would like your learners to achieve. 
In other words, Steve mentioned that we have learning objectives for novice through expert. So that's something you will need to identify. Is it important that I bring my students to the advanced beginner level or, or should they have a higher level of competency de depending on their level of clinical uh, training? Next, you have, I think, the fun part is to identify an educational method and the materials uh, to, to deliver that teaching. So, for example, um, are you going to do this as a small group discussion or are you going to do this as an individual reflection or, or you know, is this going to be a larger classroom event? Is this going to even be uh, perhaps a required logging ele element? Um, and again, our modules are um, robust with their various teaching materials. So we have uh, videos, we have case prompts, we have the role play material that Steve mentioned, all kinds of, all kinds of things um, that will engage the students. Um, and then after choosing teaching method and materials to promote that teaching, you can review examples of how that learning objective could have its competency demonstrated. But I would encourage you to only see them as examples and that you might take the opportunity to personalize um, a demonstration of competency specifically to the context of your learners. Uh, next slide. Here is um, our suggestion for educational targets or levels of competency uh, for different types of learners. Across the header, I've listed um, a variety of domains, that is foundational, linking, and aspirational. When Steve mentioned the slide with the eight domains, he called them the fundamental domain, so I don't want to cause confusion. We have labeled some of our domains as foundational. The foundational domains are those that explain the science of medical error and the nuts and bolts as to why errors happen despite the best efforts of well-intentioned uh, clinicians. And those four are error science, system science, technology, and human factors. The linking domains are those that have an impact across the entire field of patient safety and they are teamwork and communication and leadership and leading change. And our aspirational domains then would be to achieve a culture of safety and patient-oriented safe care. And I, I, make, I bring that detail to your attention because as you look at a preclinical learner, if you're dealing with the, uh, the um, very early learner, Perhaps for the foundational domains, you want them to have a reasonable understanding of these nuts and bolts of patient safety science. But certainly, when it comes to leadership and leading change or a culture of safety, they're going to be at a lower level of competency. So consider that it is not necessarily appropriate for preclinical learners to achieve, the, to achieve the same level of competency across all eight domains. Now, having said that, by the time one gets to early practice, we would hope, whether it's the medical resident or the graduate nurse or the uh, newly trained pharmacist in their first um, um, professional uh, unsupervised role, we would hope that those individuals would have, as a minimum, um, a level that they would be, would be considered competent across all eight of our domains. Next slide, please. Okay, so competent. I'm going to stick with the example of uh, teams in healthcare that uh, Steve brought to your attention. So I want to show you just how practical this can be and how you're already doing this and 
how we can just gain so much by offering additional emphasis. So if you have a learner whom you feel should be able to be competent in the understanding of the, the teams and all the types of teams that we have in healthcare, some of the ways that they might demonstrate this, or first of all, they should show that they value the benefit of an inter of effective interprofessional team. And they can demonstrate this by simply actively participating as a member of an interprofessional team or going out of their way to incorporate patients and families into the team and decision making, or by actively demonstrating that they respect the contribution of all the team members and what they bring to the discussion. So you see, these are not things that people are going to be tested on per se. These are behaviors that are demonstrated in very practical settings. So it really means that this kind of thing should be um, brought to the attention of your clinical supervisory staff, and the staff should be encouraged to acknowledge successes on the part of the learner and to offer affirmative feedback or otherwise formative feedback so that they might improve. Next slide. Step three in our simple four-step uh, recipe for success is engaging our learners. So first of all, I would say, I would set the, expecta set the expectation for the learner. Let them know what the curriculum is all about and why you're doing it and what level of competency you hope they will be able to achieve in any given domain or the, the domain that is, of course, specific to your um, area of uh, instruction. Next, I would say engage the learners by keeping it very lively. Um, give, them, give them a variety of content. Give them a video. Have them do something in the clinical setting. Get them in a small group discussion where they will discuss pros and cons of, of different experiences that they have observed. And by all means, keep it patient-based because that will be of the greatest interest to them. They are very ready to move away from the textbook, online learning, the flashcard learning, they're very eager to move on to the patient-based learning. Similarly, when it comes to learner assessment, I would avoid quote unquote tests. I would avoid, thank you, I would avoid tests because it may be that testing is just going to promote some transient or artificial uh, knowledge or behavior or, or something like that. And then really our, our clinical professional learners are tested quite excessively already. So I would suggest that more effective learner assessment comes in these active ways, having them debrief, discuss, submit reflections, or observing them in clinical settings and, again, offering feedback. Next slide. So the fourth step in the process is to assess uh, the outcomes of the small piece that you have done. So one of those is going to look at perhaps the knowledge uh, of your learners, if they're very early preclinical learners, learning those nuts and bolts of patient safety. It may be skills uh, in a simulation-based center or in the clinical setting, or it could be attitudes uh, and behaviors that are assessed um, on the clinical wards, in the pharmacy, um, or in the outpatient office. The, your next question for yourself will be, have my curricular outcomes um, been uh, appropriately, uh, have I been successful in my curricular outcomes? Have my learners' needs been met? Have my program goals been met? 
did these methods of uh, educational instruction and these resources seem to achieve the outcomes that I intended? And, you know, the larger question would be, are the health system's needs being met? Am I doing my share to prepare these students and emphasizing the points in patient safety that I need for them to carry on as young professionals into their clinical practice? And finally, you know, this is the pie in the sky, the patient safety outcomes. Would there be any measurable impact of you as a single instructor, facilitator, course director, focusing on, you know, a particular area of content within the large field of patient safety? Well, you know, I, I would argue that you have the ability to make a difference even, even with these small interventions in your, with your students in patient safety outcomes. For example, if you're working with clinical learners who are interacting with patients, a survey of patient satisfaction may show improved satisfaction as being after being included, after family and patients have been included in care discussions and decision making. Or I would also say, imagine the impact of an entire class of your students, the class of, of 2020, for example, being on the clinical ward and asking their facilitators how one goes about reporting a medical error or a near miss in this particular health system, and what types of errors or near misses should be reported. I wonder if 100 students are asking facilitators that question, if it might cause the facilitators themselves to reconsider that and ask themselves if they're doing their fair share to, to adequately report errors and near misses. So, we can go to the next slide. So I, in conclusion, I hope that this practical, small step approach to implementation makes the use of our curriculum a little bit more manageable for you. And on behalf of Steve, myself, and our curriculum work group, both at Geisinger and at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, I pose the challenge to all of you to implement actionable patient safety solution number 17 in the patient safety curriculum in your learner's experience. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shoemaker and uh, Dr. Scheinman. We so appreciate your expertise and um, your time today. I think that focusing on the implementation and, and breaking up, it up into four steps is really helpful. I just got back from a patient safety meeting and it's, we were just talking about how it's not always the what that people are having trouble with, but it's the how. So this gives us a, a real quick overview of how um, you all in the field, in the academic setting, um, and in hospitals can take these four steps and improve the implementation of the curriculum. So I really appreciate um, your time today, so thank you. So we have gotten a few questions um, for our Q&A session, so I will go back to uh, the chat real quick. So just as a reminder, if you have any questions at all, um, we do have actually about 17 minutes. Um, we'll give it 10. If we have more, we can um, keep it going. But we got a question from Edwin Hansen. He said um, his first question was, uh, that do you have examples of competencies, which we did show in slide 24, but he carries on to say um, he would like a deeper evaluation, like when you report to your department. So Peggy, Steve, I don't know who might want to take that, but that's our first question. I guess, uh, this, I, guess I will address that. So the question is, when do you report to your department? Um, I believe that if, if you as the course director have the authority to make changes within your course, then you would 
do that. And then we have to generate annual course reports and present them um, to um, our curriculum committee for um, review and comment. Um, so I would say year end, I think, is what I would do. And because this is such a, an important issue, um, I think that anything relating to patient safety that is newly integrated into the, into the course um, should be um, very much emphasized. Because our hope would be, as one individual starts initiating some emphasis on patient safety in coursework or in the clinical setting, that others will say, well, of course we, we want our care to be safe. And I think that it will just have a ripple effect. And eventually, we hope to reach a tipping point. Uh, so I would say definitely emphasize it in your year-end course report. So um, sorry, I started to answer and realized I was on mute. Um, so thank you for picking up the ball, Peggy. Um, I think what Peggy, Peggy just gave an excellent example of how you might handle this in a, in a school setting within a structured course, which is certainly one of the settings that we would um, expect this curriculum to be used. But um, I think my answer in general to this question um, would, would be it depends on your own setting because some courses are year long, some courses are, are semester based, some courses use even different schedules. And much of the use of this curriculum will not be within uh, the formal um, the setting of, uh, of degree granting. Certainly the first two levels of development, yes. But for um, competent practitioners or expert practitioners, they will already be, uh, they'll be doing this curriculum in the, in the setting of continuing professional development or potentially required uh, hospital credentialing. Uh, and so I think uh, the question as to how you report the competency will, be, will vary depending on the setting and uh, the expectation of uh, the entity to whom you're reporting it. Great. Thank you both. Um, we have another question from Rita. Rita asks, regarding the assessment part, which I, I guess she means step four, do you believe numbers are an important way to assess? like giving a grade or a percentage? I'll, I'll take a shot at that as well. Um, I think in, in some settings uh, that can be very, that can be motivating, uh, and so it might be useful, but uh, it's, it's certainly many, um, ma most medical schools are pass-fail these days, um, and uh, uh, so it's, I, I wouldn't, say it's universal, and um, I think it might be another uh, question that could be answered in a setting-by-setting in a setting, uh, basis. So it's not inherent to the curriculum. I think the curriculum lends itself to being used either way. Uh, so I think the curriculum itself is agnostic on that question, but you're, what you're asking for is, is, is advice, and I think that would, um, uh, that would depend on your read on, on the setting in which you're delivering it. Great. Peggy, any, um, any additional thoughts or should we move on? I think you can move on. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Christy Berg and she asks, can you share how you calculated or determined the 90,146 lives saved in 2018? <laughs> so that's directed to me, so I'll take that. Um, so Christy, <laughs> what we do is when we ask hospitals to make their online commitments, um, if it aligns with a, one of the actionable patient safety solutions where there are metrics available, um, we, we give them a formula for calculating those lives saved. So it's based on the NHSN, the CDC, the HIN program um, through CMS, all standard kind of ways of measuring. Now, there are topics like, for instance, handoff communications where we certainly have no proof that um, by implementing a, a handoff communications uh, process that, um, and going through checklists, for example, that that's going to save lives. So in those areas, we cannot um, have the hospitals who are reporting save lives. Um, however, if a hospital has a novel way of measuring that, 
and it differs from the recommendations that we post in our actionable patient safety solutions, we have a section that they can in, um, include the methodology that they use to measure their lives saved um, or lives spared harm. And um, here within the team, we're very cautious um, and very conservative in the numbers that we approve. Um, these are all self-reported numbers, so we do not go out and do visits or audits. Um, they purely are self-reported. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I have another question coming in from Rita, and it says, in the domains you mentioned technology as a way to improve patient safety, can you give any example? Well, okay, I'll, I'll take that one. Well, technology, Rita, we, we see as a, a double-edged sword um, because certainly technology has improved our ability to deliver care. But our subdomains um, address the impact of technology on patient safety, both pro and con. Uh, for example, um, we have um, alerts built into electronic medical records, and of course, there is a well-known there are well-known well-known data looking at people ignoring alerts because of alert fatigue. There's also the human tech interface and, and how that impacts our ability to stay focused and it, the ability of us to interact with our patients as human beings. Um, and then we, we also looked at the limitations of, of technology, specifically for folks who are trained where tech resources are very robust and then they either they go to a remote clinical setting where they don't have all those resources, or on that god-awful day when the system is down and is no longer available and its impact on patient safety based on the absence of technology. So I think if you look at the technology domain, um, you will find all kinds of interesting ways that technology us as, as uh, clinicians and the use of technology and the, the, uh, the pros and cons of how it impacts our ability to care for patients is very interesting. Thanks, Peggy. Yes, I would, uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, simply to expand on, on Peggy's last point, I think technology domain is a particularly interesting one. Uh, I would encourage um, people who are interested to um, uh, to look within the curriculum, the published curriculum, when, and the link is on the foundation's website, um, to read the competencies and to look at the resources uh, that are offered, um, because this is, um, I think, a particularly important um, uh, domain. So that would be, a, a, I, I think you'll find that reading interesting. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, we have two more questions coming in. Um, so we have one that asks from Raquel, are virtual patients a way of improving patient safety education for learners? Absolutely. I think simulation is a wonderful uh, technique. Um, uh, and uh, uh, frankly, I think that we could expand as we continue to modify the curriculum uh, on um, opportunities for um, for using simulation to demonstrate this, but it's already represented there in the in the uh, role playing exercises. Great. Mm -hmm. Next mm -hmm. question is from Vonda Vaden Bates. She asks, um, thanks to the work group who have put this curriculum together, I hope um, you will report back after it's been utilized. I'm eager to hear how instructions, excuse me, instructors and students are experiencing it. So I'm sorry, that wasn't a question. I hadn't had a chance to read it yet. So um, she gave some kudos to you all. And then we do have another question from Douglas Doughton that says, I strongly recommend that the language we use is significant. Rather than ask people to report, we should ask them to document issues. Not every safety issue is an error or an incident. Also, reporting has negative connotation to it. If we document and share, we encourage communication and knowledge building. Reports are usually a summary of analysis of the document, documented information. So again, a statement, but maybe um, if you have any reflections on that, that is the last question that has come in. 
So um, uh, I appreciate both of those comments because I think um, uh, I think they're valuable. And uh, the uh, the last one uh, regarding um, documenting, uh, it, I think fits within establishing a culture of safety. And the part of doing that is um, uh, is encouraging mechanisms that will promote um, the fullest discussion of events, and even the word event may not be the right one, um, but communication about uh, these issues. So I think, I think your suggestion is a, is a helpful one. Uh, and Vonda, I want to thank you for your comment as well, because I, I think you're making a very important point, which is that as we continue to rethink and reshape this curriculum, um, which we will be doing continually, uh, we, um, we should uh, get feedback on, um, on the from the users of the curriculum and how effective various elements of it are, uh, gather data, publish those data, um, uh, because I think they would be helpful to, uh, to everybody going forward as we uh, want to encourage more and more use of this curriculum. Exactly, and this is Ariana, I'll just chime in for a second. Um, so uh, based on the kind of getting feedback and being able to share learning, remember that any of you who work in the academic setting or in the hospital where you might have a residency program, um, you can make a commitment around actionable patient safety solution number 17, patient safety curriculum. Um, we will be adding some specialized questions here in the next um, hopefully few weeks or so, but in the meantime, you can um, kind of commit to implementing this and give details of how you plan on rolling it out. Um, we do have time, I think, for one more question. It's from Rita. Rita says, as you mentioned simulation, I would like to ask you if you believe that learners lose something by training with virtual patients. Um, I'm not you sure I understand, uh, if, unless you mean uh, virtual patients not being as effective a way to teach as real patients. Um, and if that's the case, I certainly think there's no substitute for the real life setting and for training in the real clinical setting, but uh, that um, simulation is a way um, to illustrate specific points and to demonstrate uh, things that may you may not be able and hopefully won't see, the, but you may not be able to, to anticipate reliably seeing in the clinical setting. But maybe I'm missing the point of the question. I don't know, Peggy, if you... Rita said yes, so as you were speaking when you were asking, she said yes, so. Okay. I think right. they both have value. I mean, I, yeah, I, I see it as a developmental step, um, you know, going through that simulation-based uh, practice uh, so that if you do it incorrectly, you're not going to harm anybody. Um, it's observed and somebody's giving you feedback, so you know, it's a very effective way to learn, but again, once you have those skills um, at a level of development, then you need, to, you, you need to solidify them in the clinical setting because our learners, you know, they, they have so much that they're trying to, to learn in this short period of time, and, and so much of it is just memorization, and then we we put the skills piece on as well. If we don't have them practicing these things repeatedly in the clinical setting, it's just what we taught them the year prior in simulation isn't going to stick. So it's, it's a step, but it's only the first step, and it has to be solidified by repetitive practice in a real-world setting. Great. Well, that was the last posted question. Um, we do have two minutes left. I have one more um, quick slide. Um, for housekeeping, I just wanted to let everyone know that we will be posting um, both the audio and visuals online. Um, those should be up within 24 hours. We will send you an email when they're up and also let you um, fill out a survey so that we can improve our quarterly webinars going forward. But just to wrap up, I wanted to remind you all of some save the dates that we have um, for the foundation. So our mid-year planning meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, September 17th. 
Um, on purpose, we've uh, scheduled this on World Patient Safety Day. Um, it's technically not World Patient Safety Day yet. It's going to the World Health Assembly later this month, but we've um, heard very positive uh, feedback that it should be accepted as, I think, the 10th World Health Organization Day. Um, it is co-convened with UC Irvine Health, and it will be here in Southern California. Um, you can go online and request your invitation today. And then our next quarterly webinar will be June 12th. Um, it will be on a lengthy topic called Reducing Emergency Department Boarding Time, Hospital Length of Stay, and Inpatient Mortality for Hospitalized Patients After Implementation of an Electronic Throughput Dashboard. Our expert presenter will be uh, Brandon Lau. He is Assistant Professor of Radiology and Radiological Science and Health Science Informatics at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He's also Associate Faculty of the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality. So please join us and save the date on June 12th. You can register just as you did for the webinar today. Um, and with that, it's 10 o'clock on the dot, so I will be respectful of all of your time. Again, thank you, Steve, Peggy, for your um, expertise in this area and your knowledge sharing. Thank you to everyone who joined, and we hope to speak to you and see you all on uh, future webinars and in person uh, again soon. So thank you so much.